So if we're lucky, we can get through this door without getting fucked too bad. Oh man. Meanwhile, you're getting fucked. See ya. Oh! Ooh! Just ran him through. Good work, Gaichu. And these guns didn't get mad at us. It might have been because we started the fight prematurely, and it might have been a conversation that made them activate the turrets. Deal with it. Are we back in the real subway now? Oof. Maybe not. As you move through the MTR station, several figures move to interrupt your advance. The leader is obvious, a hulking brute of a troll. He cradles a heavy assault rifle in the crook of his cyber arm and reeks of stale cigarettes and casual brutality. The name Steel Tooth is stenciled across the flag vest beneath his jacket. His eyes narrow as you approach. That's far enough for you, punk. Steel Tooth gestures towards you with the barrel of his gun, taking a drag from his cigarette. My crew's had a long night. Nerves a little raw, you know. And crunching somebody's face always brightens my mood. Let me speak in small words so you don't misunderstand. He takes a long drag on his cigarette, exhaling the smoke through his nose. Give us the prototype laser. We're going to kill you so hard your ancestors feel it. That's the best you could come up with? Steel Tooth's face twists up in annoyance. Hell with you, little man. You think you're so smart? Let's see how smart you are with a bullet in your skull. I am also a troll, little man. His voice is like gravel over sheet metal. Wu thrusts his lower jaw out, snarling over his tusks. You think you're tough, jackass? I've eaten burritos that are tougher than you. You're about as scary as a pile of wet kittens. The troll doesn't even favor Wu with a glance. Better keep your dog over there in a shorter lease, man, or he's going to get put down. The troll takes one last drag from his cigarette before spinning the butt on the tiled floor. Right, cigarette's done, which means your time's up. Hand over the prototype. You must be that genius Ares cop breaking in twice in one night. What are you talking about? Don't be stupid. The troll's shifting stance and wary eyes indicate the depth of his ability to lie. About the same as a puddle. You came to the front door first, then you came back dressed as a janitor. Hey, shut up, okay? Just shut up. I was doing legwork. And the suits weren't telling me nothing, so I had to get in and root around a bit, you know? Steel Tooth is becoming increasingly agitated. You want to keep your arms, you don't tell anybody about that. So, he can't lie for shit, so we'll lie to him. We had to ditch it back in those caves. Bullshit, nobody dumps a payday like that. Not unless they got no other choice. He fingers his rifle's trigger nervously, however. The laser had a tracking device on it, had to ditch it. Ah, hell, still though, I ain't buying it. Tell you what, we strip search you. If you don't have it, you can be on your way. How about that? The longer you hold us up, the closer they are to killing you, too. You kind of got a point there. Shit. Steel Tooth looks around nervously, hefting his gun. You shit at a tracker? You ain't lying to me? Why would I lie to you? We're both shadow runners. Yeah, yeah, you're right. A look of comprehension breaks over the troll's face like a dim candle, slowly flickering to life. Come on, guys, let's get the hell out of here. Oh, we could have taken him, too. With our fucking... Shadowrun Jr. friends. The MTR train rates. With it, the, premise, the promise of safety and freedom from any more unforeseen complications. The Yarl nods in appreciation, extending a hand to you. Thanks for all the help tonight. I don't know if I'd been able to get out of there without you. The, word, the world's better off with people like you in it. What will you do now? He shrugs and grins. The usual. Make a handoff, get paid. Probably take a few more jobs out here. Got a lot of debts to pay off, you know? Nothing's free in this life. You keep safe out there, okay? We all gotta stick together. If we don't, we end up with bullets in our back. Take care, Yarl. Oh man, that is going to fucking pay dividends later on, I'm sure. You're about to leave the station, return to Huey. Continue, continue. The MTR train pulls away from the station. You become lost in the crowd. Just another face traveling from Central towards Kowloon. Every second puts blessed distance between you and the hornet's nest of night-errant soldiers you've left in your wake. With the data planted and the GPS module in your possession, it seems certain that Ares Asia will place the blame for your run at the doorstep of the Red Dragon Association. The loss of the prototype laser is unfortunate, but alleys are often more valuable than gear, especially in the shadows. With any luck, they'll be able to pay you back soon enough. I hope so. I hope so. Think that's gonna give us some karma for our body upgrade. It totally did. Oh man, might be able to get two points in body. Charisma.
Spirit summon, yeah, let's just go body. Oh, never mind, we already had seven. The higher the skill, the more powerful to summon spirit. Kaboom. All right, now we got to get paid because I really want that talisman so we can use uh, armor three. Nobody leveled up from that. I felt that was a very profitable run. Time to claim some payment by going onto the boat. Dun, dun, dun. Jobs directory. Claim payment for the Ares prototype run. You submit the job is finished. From Steel Arm Blue, your payment is attached. I confess that I'm very pleased with your work. It's not every runner who could have pulled off a job of this magnitude. Well done. 2,000 new yen. Fucking, we're set. Inbox? No, 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 no. Mother's Notes? From Crafty Zoo. Hey, Stubtoe Williams, here are those notes you asked for, but before you dive in, a heads up. They're a complete transcription of that list from my mother's journal, as in their thoughts from and ramblings of an insane woman. It's not an easy read. Another dream. This time it was a near figure, a shadow, a wraith, faceless. I heard its voice, though it did not speak. And when I awoke, it was inside my home. Though I had been in the city just moments before, where am I? A weight dropped onto me. I felt the words of the wrath in my skin, in the tips of my hair. I saw its mouth in my mind's eye, rows and rows and rows of lies. Morning. My hand was to the paper before I even knew I was writing. I wrote the words, these words. They cannot lie. I added it to my list. Evening. Was it a king I saw? Was I really there? I was in the city, I'm sure of it. Then how did I end up here? Was I carried back? My list is growing. Soon with this knowledge, I will stop the kings. A step forward is a step backward. A step backward is a step forward. Each wraith has a name, a true name and a false name. Knowing their true name is knowing their weakness. To call, on, to call them on their lies is to make yourself invincible. They'll still try to eat you. They fear the feathers of unborn chicks. Kings must be one or the other. That is, of the negative world or positive. But positive doesn't necessarily make them good, nor negative make them bad. They simply are. Once a deal is brokered, it cannot be unmade. Kings and the planets are closely connected. When nearest the sun, their power wanes. When farthest, it grows. There is only one wraith. There is only one wraith. There may be two wraiths, but there is most certainly only one wraith. They must follow the laws of the universe, rules set in motion long ago. Should they concede defeat, all is lost to them. Kings are the rulers of us all. They take from us their lifeblood, and with it parts of their souls. Do not give them what they seek, and you will be their match. They cannot lie. Morning, I made breakfast. It fell on the floor in the shape of my death, another truth revealed to me. I added it to my list. It's all or nothing. They're all liars. Another dream. It was in white space. I could taste the color as if it were air. This time, no voice. Just rows and 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 rows. A mess, I know. There's not a whole lot of significant material other than what I already picked out. But even that is contradicted within Mom's notes. Everything should be taken with a grain of salt. Meantime, I'll keep looking into it. Good luck on your end. Auntie Cheng and Josephine? From Gobbit. Hey, Seattle. I think I can add a little context to that thing between Auntie and Josephine saying, you know, the thing that makes Auntie hit the sauce and talk revenge. This is a combo of stuff I heard, the stuff I put together myself, so your mileage may vary. For years, the Yellow Lotus acted as tax collectors within the Walled City. Since the Walled City was built by Josephine Tsang and the Yellow Lotus was run by Auntie Cheng, they must have had a working business relationship, for a while at least. From what Nightjar told me, he was her favorite, you got that right. Auntie was known as a real up-and-comer back then. She was on the fast track to be the next Yellow Lotus 438. That's a big deal. Gig, Seattle. Money and power galore. Now you need to know that there were a lot of triads and corpse doing business in the Walled City. All sorts of stuff. Sometimes they, got, they work together nicely and sometimes people get bloody. The way that I heard it, Auntie came up with some sort of grand plan to consolidate business in the Walled City. The power would be split between the Yellow Lotus and Sang's company, and everyone else would get cut out. If her plan worked, Auntie would rise in the Lotus like nobody's business, and Josephine Sang would make long bank. There was a catch, though. In order for the plan to work, both women would need to jump through a lot of hoops. There'd be street-level maneuvering and power plays on Auntie's side, and blackmail and negotiations on the corporate level from Josephine Sang. My info gets sketchy here. From what I've pieced together, Sang went behind Auntie's back and took her plan to her boss, a 438 named Wang Lan Fat. They cut kindly out of her own plan. What did Sang do to that? My guess is she saw Auntie as some sort of threat. People in the know say that Wang Lan Fat is weak and greedy. She can be, she can be manipulated if her palm remains well greased. 
Long story short, power was consolidated in the walled city just like Auntie planned, only she didn't wind up getting any of it. Her climb up the Lotus Ladder came to an abrupt halt. She's still a straw sandal, just like she was before Sang backstabbed her, and now she's stuck in Hyoya like a fly in amber. I'd be pissed too if it were me. More notes? Hey, Stubtail Williams, while I was blazing through my mom's journal, something struck me. We've spent so much time reading about the Walled City that we haven't thought to look at it, to paint a picture with the information we've been gathering. So I contacted a friend of mine, Riley Decker, and asked her to pull some data for me. Her results were surprising, and for what it's worth, I think we're on to something. Riley dug up records of things like reported sleep disturbances, psychotic, psych, yeah, psychotic breaks, HKPF responses to cult activities, etc. She found that they all form a classic bullseye heat pattern around the Walled City. She couldn't find any data from within the Walled City itself, but the outside data was still enough to establish the pattern inside the slum. This has got to be more than a coincidence. It's too unnatural to be attributed to anything else. I don't know what it means yet, but I've got my nose to the books. I'll let you know when I find out. One other thing, that last email I sent you, the one with my other notes, I went ahead and reread it, and it took me back to the source of text, and I was able to pull something else from her list. This isn't much, but it seems to be pretty consistent across her ramblings. If I'm reading it right, it's kind of like a set of rules that govern the interactions of the Yama Kings. It's surprisingly bureaucratic if I'm reading it right. The most interesting tidbit is this. There's something here about the Kings being unable to back down in a deal, like if they give an inch, they forfeit everything. From what I'm reading, the Yama Kings have their own code of laws, but they don't have to follow them unless you know how to call them on it. Like, they break the rules all the time, but if you can't cite chapter and verse on which rule they're breaking, it doesn't matter to them. Approach from a place of wisdom, though, and you can bind them with their own laws. Anyway, this is all really arcane stuff, and I think that there might be something here. I can't vouch for any of it, obviously. When you take a step back, it all sounds like crazy talk, but one thing I can tell for certain, my mother believed it was true. If anything else comes up, out of town, who's this? From Kindly Cheng. I'm not in Hyoi right now, so don't bother coming to see me. We'll talk when I return. Please continue with our business ventures in the meantime. Okay. Data retrieval. From Kindly Cheng. I hope you're enjoying your newfound success in the shadows. I've got another job for you, one that should be very lucrative indeed. I've been contacted by an employee of the Eastern Tiger Corporation and need you to steal some research data and biological samples. The man's name is Tigath Wright. Until recently, he was a researcher on a genetic engineering project. He was cagey with the details, but I gather that it's centered around phenotypic alteration and postnatal genetic enhancement. Unfortunately for Wright, he's got a conscience, stupid man. Luckily for us, he's willing to pay to have his conscience assaged. Wright's projects was apparently quite horrible. Experiments on living children, total disregard for biomedical ethics or safety, and when Wright raised concerns, he was taken off the project. He's decided to step outside the bounds of the law and expose their wrongdoing to the world. The snag you see is that his wife and child live in Seoul. Not quite the heart of Eastern Tiger's power, but close enough. He's afraid that if he releases the information himself, they'll be taken prisoner and used as leverage. The idiot should have thought of that before, but that's not our problem. The samples and data are currently on an Eastern Tiger cargo ship, the MV Nalchi, sailing near Hong Kong on their way to Seoul. The storm slowed the ship down, so you don't have to go right away, but don't take too long. Once you have the data and samples, you're to call right. I've attached his number. He'll give you instructions on how he wants the information leaked. When you're ready, let me know. I'll arrange transit with Captain Yomo. He's a local Loho Yoa pirate and smuggler, but don't let that put you off. He's as good as they get, and he'll have you on that ship without incident. Take the run. I've let Captain Yomo know you're ready. You can find him down on the end of the pier when my parlor is on. He'll handle everything from there on out. Uh, how's the BBS? Oh, fuck it. I don't have time to read all that. We're in a bit of a rush. Try to steer clear of another one of those 20-minute chat sessions on the boat. At the same time, though, let's talk to everybody. Ah, my friend, you've done an admirable job. An admirable job, indeed. I've already incorporated the technology that you recovered, my stolen tech, into a new chassis that I'm fabricating for Kishoi. Oh, wow, you move quick. Yes, well, he tips a cigarette. A cone of burning embers tumbles to the ground. I've been waiting for this for a long time. The next time we take to the field, you can expect to find Koshe's combat effectiveness considerably improved. He has become truly deathless, just as his namesake was in the Legends. When he takes damage, he will mend himself before your eyes. Can't wait to see it. Nor can I, friend. He turns back to the whirring machines that fill his shop, watching their progress with hunger in his eyes. Nor can I. Man, welcome to the team. And you, my friend, how are you? The cabin is silent aside from the occasional swish of air as Gaichu steps through sword forms. He holds each stance for a few seconds, practicing a given swing a few times before switching to the next. Hello, Stubtoe Williams. A single bead of sweat rolls down Gaichu's temple as he holds his position. After a few moments, he switches to a relaxed stance, starting to form again. 
Pardon me for continuing my exercises. I feel that I've been letting them slip of late. Don't you ever stop practicing? No, I aim to achieve perfection. I must work against my current handicap to regain the level of control that I once possessed. I am stronger and faster than I once was, but I need to learn to use my new senses more effectively in order to bring those advantages to bear. Gaichu lifts his sword, offering its edge first towards you. Do you see that edge? Forged by one of the finest swordsmiths in modern Japan. Diamond-coated edge capable of cutting even the most hardened ceramic armors. But what good is a sharpened edge without the precision to apply it? When I was still a man, I could have cut a single pea in half with my eyes closed. Oddly, after becoming blind, I cannot replicate this feat. Running the back of a claw along the blade's surface, Gaichu smiles thinly. I think soon I will be able to perform this feat again. I simply have to train my body to ignore the senses that it no longer has and pay attention to the new ones. Now, what is it would you like to discuss? How'd you feel about that last run? A good run, I think. Unexpected complications, perhaps, but all told we were quite successful. With any luck, the Red Dragon will be paid a visit by Night Air and Security, and soon. Despite the other team, we sowed enough chaos that I doubt that Ares will realize our deception. I think giving the other Shadowrunners the laser may have been the wisest course of action in the long run. The Shadows do not forget favors like that, and help in a time of difficulty is often the difference between life and death. Besides, I doubt we needed another weapon. We're quite effective as is. Oh, you can say that again, old friend. Has it been difficult to learn to fight while blind? It is not the easiest thing I have attempted, but neither is it the hardest. Placing his sword off to one side, Gaichu turns to face you. Emptiness's form is one of the great lessons of the Hagakure. Trained sufficiently in both swordsmanship and obedience will come instinctively. That is the closest to perfection a man can attain. Wait, does that mean in a perfect world you would have killed yourself when you got infected? If an order should be unjust or foolish, it should not be followed. To waste a skilled warrior as they would have by killing me. It's unacceptable. Obedience without thought is to be cultivated, but so is the moral fortitude to know when to disagree. When I was new to the unit, I thought that to be a good samurai was the ultimate goal, that to serve justly with dedication was the greatest honor a warrior could have. We were all young and foolish once, I suppose. What changed your mind? Beyond my disease? There was a fight in Fukuoka. My former team ambushed me. It had a singular effect on my worldview. We were taught that we were superior to everyone, that since we were pure humans and Japanese, we would always win. I believe that most never question the validity of this claim, even when confronted with direct evidence of the contrary. Uh, tell me what your old unit ambushed you. Very well. Gaichu draws his nails over his scalp sign. My time in Fukuoka was tense. Since leaving Kai Hanshin, I had been careful to stay out of sight by moving on foot or in the back of an automated delivery van. I was running out of food, however, and needed to be in a city for that. Fukuoka is just big enough to get lost in, but not so large that a ghoul sighting could go unnoticed. I hid in abandoned buildings and storm drainage systems, and for two weeks I managed to stay hidden. The strain of having to constantly move was wearing on me, however. I made a mistake. What happened? I had to get out of Japan, but all my contacts in Fukuoka had come up empty-handed when I asked for a way to China. I was running low on money, and I could feel the team catching up with me. A contact of mine in Kumamoto owed me a favor and arranged passage for me if I could reach the city in 48 hours. Kaichu closes his eyes, resting his face in one palm. If I had taken my time, I could have made it to Kumamoto without incident, but I let caution slip when I got his email. I thought that if I disguised myself, I could take the train there, get out before my unit got any closer to finding me. I still don't know how they found me. Magical tracking, perhaps, or simply a well-developed spy network. Regardless, they found me. They were waiting for me at Hakata Station. It was an ambush. It's a very public place for an ambush. It is. I suspect their orders were clear. However, do whatever it takes to kill me. Civilians expendable. For units like the Red Samurai, ordinary laws do not apply. The mission's success is the only concern. I had taken steps to disguise myself as best I could, relying on the sheer number of people to conceal my presence. I suspected that the team might attack while I was in public, but I did not realize just how expendable the civilians were. When they blew the C4 charges over the station's western entrance just to box me in, I realized how much I had underestimated them. I assumed that a train had derailed, honestly, but then I smelled the telltale acrid vapor of the explosives. Gaichu wrinkles his nose at the memory. Once you smell it, you never forget. The plastic explosives that we used has a particularly sharp order, like old cheese. Something to do with an old factory tag and added to help track it if it is stolen. I remember stumbling through the dust and debris trying to find my way to the rail platforms. They attacked from all sides, using the confusion to strike at once. I could hear Ishida and Takagawa behind me. Omori and Sasaki charged out of an access corridor just ahead of where I'd been standing. Sasaki threw a firewall down behind me, cutting off retreat while Omori started firing. Sound like you didn't have much choice but to defend yourself. 
Yes, that is so. Training took over. I knew I had to survive, and I was not thinking of anything but survival. So I charged Sasaki and Amori. They were only 15 meters away from me. The only advantage I had was that they were as blinded by the dust as I was, but I could still hear and smell them. Sasaki threw a lightning bolt at me, but I managed to roll under it. As I came up, Amori's light machine gun was swiveling down. I felt time stretch out as I stared down the barrel. I caught Amori in the throat with the tip of my sword. It was a maneuver I had practiced hundreds of times before. There was no resistance as I cut through his trachea, and he fell as I rolled it aside. I could hear him choking for breath as he dropped. Gaichu exhales a, humor, a humorless laugh and shakes his head. It's strange to think how clear that memory is even now. That kind of thing sticks with you. Spare me the two new in psychiatry. Obviously what you say is true, but the memory sticks with me so strongly for another reason. It was in that strike that I realized who I truly was. My whole time with the Red Samurai had focused on ensuring that I was worthy of the team. Everyone felt that way, but I felt it more acutely than most. I have always wanted to be the best, the fastest, the most precise. In the Red Samurai, I felt that to be the less than perfect would be to let the team down. We were always told how lucky we were to have been accepted into the unit. The moment my sword struck Amori, I knew that I would survive the fight. They attacked me as they would an animal. They seemed to be counting on hurting me into Takagawa and Ishida. Amori didn't even try to get out of the way of my sword strike. I recall his eyes going wide. He looked surprised that I was using a weapon and not my claws. That's a fatal mistake. He nods sharply. They thought they were fighting a beast. I would never have underestimated them as they did me. All the lessons I taught them about close combat thrown out the window as soon as their preconceptions entered the battlefield. Disgraceful. As I killed Amori, I realized that it was not that I was unworthy of the Red Samurai, but they were unworthy of me. What did I mean? What did it mean that I, an infected monster that was less than a beast, could still defeat the finest soldiers in the world? Red Samurai doctrine taught Amori and the others not to fear me, and this overconfidence would be their death. I realized that I had progressed beyond their ability to understand. My sword was as accurate as ever, but they could not account for it due to illogical blindness. Um, that's the danger of letting ideology overrule facts. Precisely, all those years I was worried I was not good enough to be a member of the Red Samurai. That somehow they had been pulling my weight, but I had been blind to all of the ways in which we were not training, or had avoided the harsh truths about our own abilities. We were so often told of our own excellence that I wondered if I had ever been truly tested. Sasaki was the next to fall. As I turned away from Amoria, I realized she must have seen me strike him. Her eyes were wide, and I could feel her fear and anger as she tried to summon another spell. She seemed caught between healing Amoria and attacking me. Gaichu tapped himself on the forehead just above his right eye. It was there on Sasaki, a downward stroke from, Jor from Jodan's stance. She had hesitated just as Amori had. I felt the breath go out of her, like someone had deflated a tire. She just slid down into a pile. I think she was trying to ask me how when I ran. What about the others? My goal was survival, not victory. Takagawa was too far away, and I did not see Ishida. I only smelled him, so I ran. The trains had been shut down due to the explosion, but as long as I could get out of the Hakata station, I knew I could escape. They did not follow me out of the city proper. From what I heard via the Matrix, the event was reported as a terrorist attack that was thwarted by brave Rumnaku soldiers. Brave, foolish soldiers. Uh, if you killed two of them, why are they still hunting you? Gaichu does not answer the question immediately. He seems uneasy with the question, fidgeting with his fingers. I'm unsure why that would make a difference. Can you explain what you're driving at? Uh, if you train with your unit so extensively, won't it be impossible to replace the ones you killed? Ah, I see. I think your mistake is in seeing this from a practical perspective. The problem is emotional, not mechanical. Folding his arms over his chest, Gaichu continues to explain. The nature of Red Samurai assignments is such that losses are generally zero, or the entire team. In those rare cases where Red Samurai teams suffer partial losses, the remnants of the impacted teams are shuffled together and undergo retraining. Sasaki and Amori will undoubtedly be replaced. The problem is that I cannot be replaced. Simply put, I am not dead. Ordinarily, a missing Red Samurai would be considered dead for purposes of reorganizing teams, but Renraku knows precisely what has happened to me. What's more, my failure to do my duty reflects badly on the unit. Others will undoubtedly resist joining my former squad as it has been tainted. So until they kill you, nobody wants to join their club? Yes, that is the case. They cannot move forward and rebuild the core of the unit unless I die, both because of their own expectations and the stain on their honor. Even if they accepted my decision, the rest of the Red Samurai would not. They have hunted me in Japan, Shanghai, and Beijing, and now I am certain they hunt me here in Hong Kong. The cycle will continue endlessly for the foreseeable future, such is the way of things. Oh, brother, if they come after you, I've got your fucking back. Wouldn't it be easier if you face them down? What do you mean? I have faced them several times in the past. Fukuoka, Shanghai, unless you have a deeper meaning I am unaware of, I have already done as you suggest. 
Uh, why don't you kill them? You think our battles have not been in earnest? You believe that I should have been more efficient in defending myself? Uh, you define yourself by opposition to your old life? What? I am unsure that I clearly understand your meaning. Can you explain yourself more clearly? Think about it. You get to live as the Ronin Red Samurai on fairly cast out by his unit. Ah, and you believe that absent that opposition, I would have little to define myself. That is very cheap philosophy stuff, Toe Williams. And unworthy of you, oh shit. Well, who are you without your unit? You tell me, what do you see? I am the creature that stands in front of you. What is it that I am in your opinion? A free man, you can choose to live as he pleases. Yes, that is what I am. So what is it that you do not accept that this is what I am doing? I seek to perfect myself my skills and my abilities in combat. Perhaps this is not the path I would have walked when I was younger, but I have been a soldier for so long that I cannot imagine devoting myself to any other trade. This does not mean that I am tied inextricably to my unit. It simply means I am shaped by my history, as are we all. I appreciate your concern about my history and my unit, but I assure you I am doing all right. I must learn to adapt to my new condition and lifestyle on my own. The time will come when they find me in Hong Kong. Well, we'll be ready, brother. That's all I need. Until later, my friend. Keep yourself safe. You too, got you.